Welcome to Roll for Persuasion. I'm your host, Andrew Richardson. This is the most straightforward Dungeons and Dragons podcast on the internet. Uh, We don't actual play. We don't min-max. We don't talk about builds or characters. We talk about this game that we love, the the greatest role-playing game on the planet. Um, It's pretty simple. I go out into the world. I find people who love this game as much, uh, as more, really, than I do. And uh, I convince them to come talk to me about it. Today, the person that I have convinced is John Boltina of Cauldron and Tower. John, great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. John, uh, if you're not familiar with his work, he is at Only Play Wizards on Twitter and Instagram. You can go check him out. Um, you can also check out at Cauldron and Tower. Um, John and his writing partner have two, I think, modules out right now on DM's Guild, if I'm correct. Yeah, two adventures, yeah. Awesome. So two adventures. So, so go check them out. We'll get into that a little bit more um, later in the show. But John, you are a professor. Um, you, you mentioned that right now you're teaching classes on writing. And one of the things you mentioned before we started recording was that you are actually going to be teaching a class next semester about role-playing games in particular. Is that right? Yes. Yes. The name of the class is, uh, it falls under a category of class we have at the, at the school called Spark, which is the idea is that students are to generate research questions over the semester. And this one is titled Dungeons and Dragons Skills for IRL, so in real life. And the idea is that we're looking at the way that role-playing games generate, um, can be used for research and help us understand our research or uh, propel research uh, in different facets. Very awesome. I'm I'm excited to think about uh, parents getting their kids' transcripts and their grades at the end of the year and being like, well, you got a D in physics, but you got an A in a uh, role playing tools IRL. So, so tell me more about that. <laughs> so, so that should be fun. Yeah, well, that's the, I, I don't. That's what they like about teaching college. I don't have to deal with the parents. Right. So uh, totally. <laughs> so, so that that's kind of interesting because it kind of touches on um, one of the reasons that I I do this podcast and it's that mm-hmm. idea that the not just D and D but role playing games in general offer so many different opportunities, not just for storytelling, but for problem solving, for um, social interaction. Uh, mm-hmm. I know someone here in my town, I'm down here in Texas, um, who teaches D&D to kids at, I get this, a local Presbyterian private school, which I feel like 20 years ago might not have been, <laughs> might not have been a thing. Um, but but there are just so many opportunities to use this game to to reach people in different ways. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's take it back a little bit and let's uh let's focus on you for a second. What is your history with uh, D and D role playing? When did you first kind of get into this? And and real quick, I'll give you kind of my background because it's interesting to me at least. I I <laughs> describe myself as Dungeons and Dragons adjacent for most of my life, um, okay. meaning I I read Dragonlance and I was playing Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter. And I was, um, you know, loved R.A. Salvatore and, and Sword Cut, yeah. all that stuff. Did not find out literally until like two years ago that that was all Dungeons and Dragons, right? Mm-hmm. Like it was just awesome fantasy stuff that I loved and, and was apparently next to this game that I never had a chance to discover. Um, except for one attempt when I was like 11, I, I bought a used copy of the uh, the Star Wars role-playing game rules. Oh, yeah. Built Let's a character. Yeah, built a character, got all excited, then realized that it was kind of hard to play by myself, and then uh, and that was that was my one foray. So I'm fairly recent to the game. I've been playing and DMing for just about two years now, but mm-hmm. uh, very long in the genre and in the world without ever really realizing it. So I, I, I found that everyone kind of has an interesting story about how they came to the game, so I'd just uh, love to hear yours. Okay. Um, so there's the beginning and there's like the, the prequel as it, as it would be. Um, the beginning is really starts when I was nine years old. Uh, so this would have been about 1990. Um, and the, my first real introduction to Dungeons and Dragons was, uh, my buddy, we had been playing, uh, before that we had been playing Heroes Quest, uh, which is, which was by Milton Bradley, just by Milton Bradley and developed by Games Workshop. It's an excellent board game, a lot of fun. And it has the, dun- it kind of has the Game Master slash, uh, you know, you know, players, right. something like that. We played a lot. And then at, at the local shop in town, which was called Hobby Castle, had, it was a hobby store, so it was like RC cars, RC planes, uh, crafts, like, you know, uh, knitting stuff, yarn, models, but they also had miniature war games and role-playing games. And I used to go there with my mom to get crafts and everything like that, and I'd, I'd look at all those kind of cool the models and the miniatures and everything like that. 
And so I was aware of it. I didn't really understand what it was. And, but we knew we were playing Heroes Quest. And we heard this was kind of similar to Heroes Quest. So we were like, all right, my, my buddy picked it up at Toys R Us of all places, the, the basic set, which is actually really funny because Toys R Us at the time it was, or for a long time, was owned by Hasbro, which later on, you know, owns Wizard right, of the Coast sure. and then like, CSR. Um, and we ended up uh, picking it up and we played a little bit of the basic set. Um, it was the, the one with the big, the big black box with the big red dragon on the cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, we played that. I played a Paladin and had some fun with it. And, uh, that was about when I was nine. Yeah. And before that, I was painting some miniatures here and there and just kind of, uh, Jason activities, playing other, other board games and stuff like that. They were similar. Um, but that's when I really kind of started taking interest. And then it was hard to play cause it was, you know, getting in groups of, of, you know, it's hard to do it by yourself as a small group. And so we, I ended up kind of just playing, uh, a computer game. So I, I think the first real, my, my first real hardcore, like, like game I got into where I was playing a lot was, um, I the Beholder on PC. I got that from my mom's best friend's husband. And I used to, we used to go down there and, and he had all these old board games. Um, he had been playing D&D back in the 70s and miniature war games when he, when he was younger. And we used to play a lot of uh, Dungeon, the, with the exclamation point, the, the original Dungeon, uh, which TSR put out as kind of a way to like help fund uh, their, their stuff early on. And I had a blast and I loved it. And he, him and his daughter, and then they, he was like, you know, hey, why don't you, um, you know, take this, this computer game I'm not playing anymore and, and play, you know, take it home. I was like, all right, cool. And I hold her, and I got really hardcore in how the system worked and really had a lot of fun with it. Um, that, that one's hilarious because, you know, the, the, the game, you kill, you kill the Xanathar. Like, you straight up kill him. Right. Uh, and so, so it's kind of funny looking back at that. Um, and so that was kind of my kickoff. And then uh, in middle school, I started playing um, – I, I started kind of getting more into D and D again, and then played a lot of BattleTech. BattleTech, a fun game, man. Goddamn, BattleTech was a good game. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I was like kind of doing the adjacent stuff with computer games and everything. And, and that went through middle school. And I got a group finally in middle school that was pretty good. And we played for about a year and a half together. And um, it was crappy. I mean, our games are crap looking back at it. But it, you know, we had fun. We were just little kids. And then high school, I played a lot. Um, and it kind of died off in college a little bit because I was really busy. And then um, about when I kind of went, I played some Star Wars, some other role playing games. But uh, it's a long, you know, it's a big, uh, big long history. Yeah, I, I got started off really just with the adjacent stuff, the board games, and saw it around. So let's try it out. You know, that's kind of how I got kicked off. So yeah, I'm not really sure else to to talk about. With yeah, it. yeah, no, no. So, so, so I mean, like you said, playing for a long time, and then you fast forward to now, you're grown up. And yeah, you decide, you. I, I assume, I assume you're, are you still playing actively? Oh yeah. No, yeah. I'm actually sitting at the table we play at. Um, oh, I awesome. have a, a group of about eight to nine players. Um, some of my players I've been playing with for about, oh geez, like 15 years. Um, we had one that's been, he had to kind of bail out cause, uh, his personal life, but like, uh, I've been playing with him for 25 years, you know? So it, there's some, there's some people I've been playing with for a long time. Um, and, uh, yeah, my current group, we, we've been together now for about, uh, about five years. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We're on our, we're on our second, the, it's my second campaign for them. Uh, it's a sequel to my first campaign. And then we usually do summer. We do alternate campaigns. Um, cause the people are more available. So I'm, I'm currently DMing. Um, but we played Ravenloft for two summers and last summer my one friend wanted to DM and she tried it out and we played the dungeon in the box stuff and it was fun. It was, it was a cool low, low level game and just a blast. It was nice. I got to play and, um, Ravenloft was a lot of fun. I dominated Ravenloft. Like, um, I, my, when I play, like my, my friends know that like, it's going to be very, uh, very interesting. That's why I have to play wizards. Cause I only play wizards cause right. uh, I play very smart. I play a smart character cause I'm, I have a hard time dumbing myself down. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, but I played a druid actually in Ravenloft. That was actually, a, I had a blast playing, playing a druid and I was terrifying. So it was good. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so somewhere in the midst of all this, um, I mean, obviously, like you said, you're DMing, you're running games. Mm. So at, at what point do you decide to to take what you're doing at the table and make it into something that you can share with other people? Okay, so so yeah, Cauldron Tower. Cauldron Tower is kind of a, a, a ways coming. Um, I, my, one of my players and I, Jeremy, had actually built the stuff for DMs Guild very early on when it first opened up. We actually did two releases called Further Legions, which we had, we had thought was going to be a series. And the premise, we have two of them called Hob- there's Hobgoblins and Bugbears. And it's really funny because the Hobgoblin one keeps selling. Like, it just keeps selling. And it's only 50 cents. And all it is, is what we did was 
we saw the core fifth edition book and we really felt that the variety of like common monsters like hobgoblins, bugbears, uh, were lacking. Yeah. And I had all, I have like, I have tons and tons of miniatures and there's tons and tons of these prepainted miniatures that, that have been, uh, released over the years. And they used to come with like a little card for like stats for 3.5 and then for the miniature game. And I missed that. So what we did was we went through each, I took every single bugbear I had, I got one of each miniature and we wrote stats for each one of them. And that's what the further allegiance is. Um, and so we, we got through hot and bug bears and we were going to do more, but like we just, he ran out of time and I, I didn't have time to do it. Um, but they're fun. Um, and we're, I'm kind of doing it again a little bit. I actually have a piece coming out on the DMs guild here. Uh, I was going to premiere it as part of their Halloween thing, which is kind of little hidden gems on the site. Mm-hmm. But, um, the, uh, I am, uh, waiting, uh, uh, to reveal that one till Halloween. And then after, after Halloween promotion, it'll be available for sale. Okay. So it'll be free during the promotion and then available for sale later. And it's about, uh, I'm just taking, I have all these custom monsters for my, my own games that I want to use. I like, might as well make some money off. Them. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, what happened was I had been trying to do it and I try to write my own stuff and I'm just undisciplined. Like I'm, I'm as a writer, I'm really undisciplined in my own stuff. And I had my friend, Amanda, um, who like, like a lot of my, so it, one of the, one of the more quirky elements of my D and D playing and my relationships is that actually my D and D group, two of my players are ex-girlfriends Okay. and we play at my house. We play at my house, with my wife and one of their husbands plays with us and everyone's super cool. It's super great. We have, you know, it's just super above the board and everything, sure. but actually Amanda and I, uh, had dated, uh, a few times and it just didn't happen. It was fine. We weren't mad at each other and that we kept in touch. And so, um, it, it's really, it's really shocking at how far not being a dick can go. Like there's not being a jerk <laughs> right, can go. Right. It's shocking. Many people don't and realize so, just how far not being a dick can go, but give it a try. Hey man, my, my wife, it's worth it. My wife, my wife is an ex-girlfriend and she dumped me and then she realized she messed up. So it's all good. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, and, you know, we, we laugh about it, but, um, yeah. And I knew that the man was trying to write novels and she was interested in writing. And I was like, you know what? Hey, you know, let's, let's bring her in. And I asked her and she was like, let's go for it. And I was like, all right. So I, w- I was going to LA for like a concert and I asked her, I said, you know, why don't we, uh, she lives in, she lives a little bit far south from me. And I was like, why don't we, uh, you know, meet for lunch and I'll tell you what my idea is and what, what I kind of do is this Calder and Tower thing, or we didn't have a name for it at the time. And she was like, okay, cool. And she liked the idea. She was excited. And I was like, oh, I'm going to come back through on town in two, three days, something like that. And we'll meet. And you just pitch me, pitch me your five ideas. Just pitch me five ideas. And we'll go from there. And we came back and she pitched me an idea. And that's that the first idea she pitched me, I loved. And it was Children of the Hills. And that was it. And I was like, all right, cool. We're going to do Children of the Hills. We're going to do that idea. And so the premise was that we would knock it out with no budget. We would do it in two months and have it for sale and go from there and see if, it was, if we could actually do this. And we did. And so the cover was, it was actually funny. The co- my wife did the cover um, because I did the cover and she, my wife's a art uh, educator and she was like, you, you suck. <laughs> and so she's like, she's like, she's like I'll just do let, it. Let, let me take be, care of this. Yeah. I was like, well, this took me 30 minutes. She's like, all right, let me show you what I can do in 15. And she knocked it out. Right. And so we, um, we went up there. Um, but part of what, appealed to me about working with Amanda as well is that she's uh, an esthetician. She does, uh, you know, she, she does uh, makeup and hair and nails and all this kind of stuff. She's great at it. And she's always been interested in fashion. And we wanted to, uh, along with both of us, have a distinct interest um, in, ma- in, in uh, magical practices and, and occult studies and such. And so we kind of wanted to go with that kind of aesthetic and bring that to our, our writing and so that's it's part of the reason why we work so well together, and we kind of wanted to bring all that together. And that's what we got with Calder and Tower, you know, and and, uh, and everything. And we were both big music fans. Um, it was funny because we know a lot of the same people uh, in Fresno that do music. We you know we know them from different circles, but um, yeah. So we we kind of worked with that, and that's where it kind of kicked off. And we wanted to do clothing. We wanted to incorporate music. And one of our major things was like I was like, there's this music element, there's clothing that goes for D and D and and stuff like that. I'm like, why don't we make that into one product? So I think if you if you bought Wolf Lord, it came with a song, and that's what we're hoping to do with that whole series is have these original songs from different Dungeons yeah, and artists yeah. that come with it, and and to make the and then do the clothing as well um, as a way to 
uh, make it so the experience doesn't end with the game, you know, or there's an experience that leads into the game, whatever right. you want to do. Well, I want to get back to, to Wolf Lords um, in a second, but you mentioned, you mentioned okay. clothing, um, which is, which is how I found you. Cause I saw somebody yeah. retweet. I don't know if it was like, uh, probably one of the DMS I follow. You did a contest giving away the shirts. I'm actually wearing it now. It's a fantastic shirt. I wear it all the time. Thank you. Um, but what caught my eye, you were doing a giveaway, give away the shirt. What caught my eye was the branding. Um, like mm-hmm. just a fucking fantastic logo. Like, like you. if you put out no content, I would still buy all your shirts. Um, and I just want to say Cauldron and Tower is not sponsoring this podcast. Um, no. but they, they, I mean, you should totally go check their stuff out. And, and so, so I, I would just say for you, like so far you've done that, right? I've, I've been reading through your adventure and the adventure is really good. I want to find a way to run it. Um, but you've also, I haven't listened to the song yet, so I'll need to get Wolf Lord, but, uh, you have this awesome, awesome graphic. So kind of what, h- how did you do that? And I ask that because I see a lot of people try to make things without a plan, without intention. And they just kind of go and they slap together like a, a graphic from Fiverr and, and, and they go, but you have this yep. legitimately, um, awesome kind of graphical it's very kind of a kind of death saves esque um very kind of old school rpg art Uh, how did that come about okay so there's a few elements there's a lot there's a lot going on there actually Uh, it's complex pleasure so first off i'm a big music fan uh the listeners at home they can't see me uh andrew can see me but i'm 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 actually sitting in front of my record collection right now there are a lot of records let's just make that clear there are very many records behind john right now yeah i have i have something like 2500 records or something like that and so music is a big, big thing for me. Always has it. No matter what I've been doing in my life, I love music. Always love music. And so because of that, I know a few artists, uh, like like graphic designers, and I like uh, I like posters. I have like, I have a bunch of posters up my wall of different artists and everything like that too. Um, and I, I I kind of become friends with a lot of the artists uh, and was aware of their work and got in kind of early with a lot of them, like and such. So the one that did our logo was uh, Marta Maldondo, I believe her name is, uh, out of Bronca Studio. And so Bronca Studio uh, is a guy named Paul. And Paul does, he was doing posters, and now he does like a lot of merchandise and everything like that. And he's out, they're both out of Spain. Uh, they're a couple. There's just an article about them recently that came out. And they do, for a lot of bands, I mean, so they've done work for Food Fighters. They've done work for Black Sabbath. They've done work for big artists. And I knew that Paul was not not cheap to work with, but I also knew that Marta was, was doing a lot of work on kind of the side. And she's really does a lot of Lord of the Rings stuff for her personal taste. And was kind of doing stuff for school. And I really liked her line art. I really, really liked her lines. And that's what I usually look for an artist is like, I can spot artists by looking at their lines or their stroke style. And so I thought, okay, uh, let me approach them. Interesting enough, they actually were our first, uh, our first, the, our first choice. Um, our first choice actually was a guy named Karma Zid, who I friggin love, but he was too busy. Um, and I got some of his original art here and he, he's a buddy and he, he's super cool, but he was just too busy. And we needed, we had, we had, a, he basically, he was like nine months. And I was like, oh, that's too long. I need, I need like two. So I hit up Marta and she gave me a nice quote and I paid my deposit and she gave me options. And what happened was that she actually, I told her uh, the way I did the logo originally was, uh, if you go back our, our feed really far, was I actually have like a little plastic cauldron I got for like Halloween and I have like a pewter ta- castle and I put that in there and that was the logo. And I was like, that's what I want. Yeah. I want the tower coming out of the cauldron. And she was like, okay. So she, and I, and I saw this cauldron, there's a cauldron from the whiz kids uh, miniature line that has a little devil head on it. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So I took that as inspiration and sent all these pictures and she shot back to me three cauldrons and three towers and said, these are what I have and we can mix and match. And I was like, dope. So we mixed and matched and we came up with that. Um, and so it, it's just kind of this idea of, and I do that with my tattoos. I, I, I have a of my tattoos. I, I send my artists what I want to kind of stuff that's inspiring me, what I want. And they like to work with it. And then they gave me options and we knocked them out. We actually did a flashback uh, Friday, a uh, throwback Thursday, excuse me, a few weeks ago where we showed off like the original designs she actually gave us. Um, and you can kind of see where it got derived from and, uh, it was, it was fun, you know, that, that's kind of what we did. So as far as the artwork goes, we, we work with, um, people that are in, uh, the music scene and do a lot of design for merchandise. Um, our other artist that we worked with is David Paul Seymour, who, who's the cover artist for Wolf Lord of the Old. 
Um, he will be the, he has, we have a cover art for him for our next release coming out in October, which is um, uh, The Complete Revenant, which we just showed off. And then yeah, we yeah, have, I was looking we, at that on your, uh, your Instagram, yeah. And, and then we have our, uh, our follow up to Wolf Lord Yule, the next part, which I haven't said the name publicly. It's actually the name of the next adventure is actually in Wolf Lord Yule. <laughs> and, uh, and so we so, so di- if, if I dig through the, far enough I, I can I can unearth the, you, uh, the I think it's the name. last line of the yeah it's the last line of the adventure on page 34 it says to be continued in and then to something and then but what we we, we are, we're teasing out that if, if Wolf Lord Yule goes silver on DM's Guild so 100 sales uh, we'll show off the cover for the next one which we're hoping to have on November maybe December but hopefully November and then um, and the like yeah so we we work with these guys that kind of work with the middle community and everything like that too. And uh, we're not the only ones that have done this. Uh, By all means, Death Space does do this. Um, They work with a lot of great artists. Uh, D-Fame is one that I I really like that did the uh, Paladin Hell shirt for them. Um, There's a, they have a lot of guys they work with uh, and they kind of pulled, but they also have a lot more, uh, they got a lot more resources than us. And so, (laughs) Um, yeah, Joe Maginello well, yeah, kind of helps give you a, a little bit, uh, a little more backing when you got that going on. Sure, it does. Yeah, I won't kid you. Because um, uh, that was the thing we did. Troll the hills on no budget, and then the idea was like, well, let's have a budget. And Wolf Lord Yule, we had a budget, and we, I, I it, it, but part of my 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 premise too with with uh, Calderon Tower, in terms of doing the logo and, and the cover for Wolf Lord and what I choose, and what I want for art is. Um, I was like, well, if I buy this art for just a cover, is that all I'm getting? Is that the only value I'm getting out of it? So, but then I'm like, well, if I have the license to it, I can also print clothing. I can print shirts. I can print buttons. I can make other merchandise. And so it's kind of, I won't get it. It's a money saving technique. It's, right, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> no shame. It's, a, it's economical use. Um, we have very few restrictions when we, when we get our art. I know David, David's pretty public about it, but he has, um, the one restriction on his art is that it can't be used for any promotion or any kind of uh, association with beverages because he has an exclusive license with a, a, a beer company. Right. Um, and that's not a problem, which, but it does suck because actually I, I've kind of become buds with a guy from uh, Smuggler's Coffee and, and he's been super cool. Um, and I can't work with him on certain <laughs> things because like, he can't, can't use the art. Because I don't want David to be like, "Hey, you can't use my art anymore, bud." And I'm like, "All right, you know." So, well, technically, but, um, if, if it's a if it's a dry bean, is it really a beverage? Legally, coffee, you might have man. a leg to stand on. It's, it's, it, yeah, I know David's pretty specific. So I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to poke the bear. But sure. No, um, I won't kid you. Yeah, Death Days was a, a huge influence on us. Um, I actually got one of their first uh, Red Death Knight shirts, um, and and it, it was kind of a. I really liked what they were doing. They were bringing this kind of aesthetic, uh, combining it. Um, bringing these kind of like, like it felt like a, like their styles are merging in nostalgia. It's taking different, like, like the artwork, like I did a Paladin Hill shirt's a good example. So Paladin Hill, I remember seeing the artwork as a kid. And I also remember when they did the re-release of it for second edition. I, I love that artwork and grew up with it. And then seeing this guy, D-Fame, who does, who does uh, like this hardcore death metal art, uh, was uh it was really cool you know i i, I like that kind of like updated version of it um and i they they do a quality product like i mean they they pick good shirt they pick good clothing shirts um uh they they do pretty high quality print they do really high quality prints honestly um we the one that and that was kind of a thing with us is that i like all that stuff and it's great but what we wanted to do with ours was a lot of it was we wanted to do with uh local so actually all my shirts are printed by my, my barber's husband. <laughs> um, she has a, she has a barber shop downstairs uh, called a uh, stranger's shop. And then he has, he runs his print shop upstairs from the barber shop. And so um, one of the ways we save money is we don't have our shirt shipped. <laughs> <laughs> right. You, you, hey, when you get a haircut, that's also a t-shirt pickup. Yeah, day. I go get a haircut. Well, I, I don't go too often, but like I just go down there and it's Eli. I'm like, Hey man, let me get my shirts. And, um, and he specializes in discharge printing. So the shirt you're wearing is discharge printed, um, which means that it is the fabric is redyed. Right, it right. So it's not like a. Um, it's not like a. When when you touch it, it's not like a uh, like an iron on or that kind of like physical no. tacky. It's like in the actual cloth. No, 
Yeah, usually it's like a plastic transfer to the material is kind of melted on the material, and this one is not. It's, it's a re of fabric. The problem, we do have some issues with it, is like you're limited on color. It only goes from, it, you can only go from a dark color to a light color. Um, so like we're, like our, our uh, witch's milk shirt is actually uh, the, I think it's the plastisol is what they call it or something like that. I can't remember what it's called, but like it's not the, we can't do discharge printing on that. So, but um, yeah, it, it, there's, there's a lot of kind of uh, techniques I've, I've used it to, to work through this and such, but yeah, no, we, we, um, we, we wanted to do the apparel, but we also wanted to actually do or have original music. So we've been working with dungeon synth artists. Um, I love dungeon synth. I play it during my games. I have a huge, like, I think it's like 96 hour long playlist or something like that. I play during my games. So it's, a, you know, nothing repeats. And I, I actually participate in the community and try to like listen to it and buy stuff. And um, we actually do our, our follow Fridays, where I'm saying, hey, here's some artists on Bandcamp. They're like, you know, they're indie artists. They're they're small, and check them out. You know, go out and buy their stuff. They support them, and the artists always have respond really well. They love that people are actually, you know, taking their music and using it in their game and everything. And, and that, that's a big history of it too. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a big history of the overlap of music and D and D, right? Um, and art. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, one of the more, one of the most controversial artists in the black metal community is uh, Bergson. You know, and and Varg's, you know, he's kind of a piece of piece of he's a piece of shit of a human being. But one of his albums, he straight up traced the original cover for Elemental Evil and made it his cover. You know, that's awesome. He he stole he, he stole just straight from up D&D. stole it from D and D. That's awesome. Yeah, but I mean, so did, but you know, to be fair, the early TSR stuff they traced over like Jim Steranko art and everything like that too. So it's like you know, there's, right, there's, there's, right. there's a big history of of this kind of, of this kind of being influenced by different things around us. Um, and, and if, if, and if you're listening and, and you're someone like me who, uh, is, is fairly new to, to D and I, I didn't start until five E came out. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons actually put out a book called art and Arcana, yeah. um, within, I think it was like a year ago, something like that. Fantastic book, not just for the art, yeah. which is amazing, but just if you want to understand some of the history of Dungeons mm-hmm. and Dragons and see some of the art that John's talking about, that's kind of inspired, yeah. um, you know, stuff that he's doing that, that other people in the community are doing. Definitely check it out. It's a great book to kind of give you that, that full quick background on the history of this game. I, yeah. I actually just watched that documentary. I, the beholder, the one about the history of art is a documentary on, yeah, on Amazon yeah, yeah. Prime, I believe. Yeah. And it was pretty good. And it was really interesting hearing about kind of, um, how they're, they're in the, the in-house artists they had. Like I, I didn't realize these guys were in-house and that, that's really interesting to me because so I'm, I have before, before all this, I was doing a lot of comic book stuff with my friends and my, my, my best friend's a, a comic book artist. And he, he's pretty, he's very successful. I'll say, um, uh, Jay Swan's a third. He did the last Sandman book with, with Gaiman. And the, the, the thing about the comic book artists now is that they don't, there are no like in-house artists. Uh, Marvel used to have a studio in New York where the artists would all come in and work and then, you know, they sure, would, they would sure. work at the, the desk and everything. But now everyone's kind of, there's no one really has a studio. There's very few of them. I think there's like one or two in the States now. And so I, I had no idea that like TSR had a studio, had like these guys like Easley, um, Elmore, et cetera, in house, in the building working on this stuff that much. I thought they were kind of doing it from home and then just sending it in. But apparently, I mean, I had no clue. So that's pretty mind boggling to bring that much talent. Right. Yeah. And the, the right. movie really, really showed that, like really showed like how it all kind of worked and how it all kind of developed and um, how like Gygax like got these guys to come work for him. And he just offered them tons of money. And that's what they did. They threw money at him. Right. And, I'll, you know, I'll just, oh, yeah, right. and, and a lot of them gig. started out kind of as, as fans or right. Who were writing into the, the magazine or whatever, um, you know, submitting stuff as stringers. I, I think that's how Chris Perkins got involved. If I remember an interview he did. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then eventually they were like, hey, why don't you come over here and work? And that you know, clearly worked out for him, so. Oh, yeah, the, the, a lot of people start low-key and, and, and build their way up into it, yeah. So, but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, the community's grown a lot, uh, and it's, it's I, I really, so where it is right now, where D&D is right now to me, um, in terms of kind of the popularity, uh, the streaming, and this this kind of, Growing up with it, I never saw the celebrity culture there is with it right now. Sure, sure. Um, where there, there was like celebrities in, in the community, and I I never really put together a celebrities playing. I had heard about like Robin Williams playing, and I heard about like Vin Diesel playing, all that kind of stuff, but didn't really see anything like that. 
And so my, the, the current thing with like the success of critical role and everything, I really, I, I can trace it back. I, I have a single, I have a, I have a, I've been kind of pronounced about this and, and as a single moment when that, when that, when I believe that could take off and I trace it back to 2010 and uh, I was privileged to be there. I think is the best way I can put it. So back in 2010, I was at, I lived in Los Angeles. I was going to UCLA and I had known that there was a D and D meetup group at meltdown comics. And I knew the team Phoenix let it. Um, and I was a little surprised to hear that the team was leading. Cause I, I, I knew of her, but I, I didn't, I didn't associate like her with D and D at the time at all. I didn't associate anybody with D and D at the time, to be honest. And so I was like, I was gonna check it out. And I went down there and hung out and found that she was doing this, um, the, the, the precursor or whatever it is of, of the chair D 20 stream that she kind of does now. Yeah. And they're going to have celebrities in. And I was like, all right, well, you know, she's like, you need production assistance. And I was like, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll get people drinks and whatever. You know, I got nothing better to do. It'd be fun. And I remember, uh, Pat Kilbane was there. Uh, I knew him from Mad TV. Um, uh, there was a few other people there. Uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Keith Baker was there. Um, but I always, but the one thing that sticks out to me about the whole thing was this. So I'm, I'm working, I'm getting people drinks, whatever. And I'm working with the other PA We're we're getting, you know, people's orders together, whatever they want. And, uh, he's like, he's like, he's like, dude, you got to go out there and like go to table three and like watch the game. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? He's like, something's up. He's like, dude, the DM, like, he's like, the, the DM's like insanely good. He's like, I've never seen anything like it. You got to watch it. Like, what do you mean you got to see this guy DM? He's like, you got to see this guy DM. Like, it's, it's crazy. So I'm like, all right. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I've been playing DD for 20 years. Like, I got to see someone DM. Right. Oh, man, <laughs> right. Whatever. I'm like, what the hell do you mean? So I go out there, I'm getting him drinks, I'm watching the game. And his DM is like, I mean, the guy, this guy's immersive. Like, he, he, he's describing stuff well. He's moving. He, he does voices, everything. And I'm sitting there like, holy shit, like this, this is something. This, this is, this is something. And that was Matt Mercer. Right. And Crazy. I, you know, I, don't, I didn't know who Matt Mercer was. You yeah. Know, I, 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 he's this voice actor, dude. You guys see him. Like, you got to see him DM. But now everybody sees him DM. Right. And so, you know, like, like <laughs> it, it and, I, and I saw that and I was like, I had never seen that much I mean I, I played D with a lot of like all the theater kids back in high school and I had seen performances in a sense but like I had never really seen it done to that extent and I and I knew something was up. I knew this was gonna get bigger. And I and and I really I blame Satine. Uh because she's the one that brought everyone together and, and really got us kind of rolled off and everything and, and you know so it's it's really um that was a really magic time, really magic moment. Uh, and you know, you come four or five years later and you're and critical role drops and then now it's, it's, it's unreal. And, uh, but yeah, I just, I knew something could happen. I, just, I knew there was something going to happen and I wasn't sure what it would look like, but now seeing it, it's like, holy hell, like it's, it's unreal to me, you know? So yeah, it was really cool. It was, it was a really cool moment in time. Um, yeah, I mean, really as, about it. As, yeah, as someone who has, who has benefited from, you know, the, the, the popularity that D and D has, mm-hmm. has achieve because it, it was something I always wanted to do and never really got a chance and and uh, my wife and, and another group of our friends very into to games we were playing a game called uh, Time Stories um, which is a tabletop it's a board game and it was it was more of like a choose your own adventure style game so there mm-hmm. were RPG mm-hmm. elements there was dice rolling there was decisions that impacted how you played and at some point my wife was like well why don't we try Dungeons and Dragons and I was like we can't find people who want to play Dungeons and Dragons but then one day I, I was like, yeah, I'll YouTube uh, how to play Dungeons and Dragons and a random episode of Critical Role, this thing I'd never heard of before, popped up and I watched it and, and like I was hooked. I was like, oh, you mean yeah. I can do this and it's a game? Like I can do this with other people? Let, let's make it happen. So so I, I've certainly benefited um, from oh, yeah. that kind of exposure that, that I, I probably I probably would have tried it eventually, but mm-hmm. but it's made it accessible, you know, to people who who would you would have never imagined there there's a feud on Twitter Absolutely. right now some professional wrestler um yeah, do you I see I, I don't remember his name uh, just a total character move making fun of D and D because the yeah. guy he's wrestling is a big critical role in D and D player and it's crazy right like it's crazy that that it has achieved that level of you know forget yeah. like Stranger Things like it's it's in Twitter and wrestling like it, it's a whole thing it's it's a snowball that's not slowing down it's it's awesome 
It is. It, it's a it's a really big difference. Um, so I, I I don't I talk about it every once in a while, but um, it, yeah, it wasn't. We talk about the kind of the dark times of it, and where you couldn't really be open about it, and that that was very much my experience uh, when I was younger. And there was people that kind of saw through it. My mom saw through it. My dad did not. My I there's at least two occasions in my life where my dad threatened to burn my books. Um, and wow, for stuff that was completely unrelated. Yeah, I mean unrelated. You know, uh, got in trouble at school, whatever. And he's like, oh, clearly this is what's doing it. I'm like, no, it's you know, you ever think that like your ki- your kids got depression or something like that? And now you're gonna take the take away the thing that makes them happy. You know, um, and so there's always been this kind of lack of understanding of what it is. And I, I, I kind of get that. Um, but I, it's really, you know, it's, dude, it's just, it's just like, it, it's just pretend with a structure, you know, and that, that's what it is. It, it's sure. just me and my friends, you know, when like you have a nerd, they call it nerd poker. I mean, that's not a bad, that's not a bad way to put it either. And my friends and I hang out and it's, it's great. And we love playing. Um, I, I really think that the one thing that like the popularity has done that I really like is it has brought in so many uh, craft people to make better and nicer stuff. Like I have a custom DM screen. Um, I have some custom, uh, I got some like uh, my, my death safe counter I have from 1980 who I got some, you know, cool dice, dice towers, cards. Sure, I love yeah, that yeah. the standard out there. And I love those people that are fans. They don't, there, there's, there's a, there's, this is one thing that's called an tower that I made a distinction in that, that my blog post you, you read where I said there, you can be a fan of, and I fully believe this. You can be a fan of D and D and not play. Totally. You can be a fan of Cobra totally. Roll and not play completely. You can be a fan of D and D and make screens and you can make terrain and paint miniatures and all that stuff and not play. Okay. Now the, the trick with, with Calder and Tower you wanted to, is that we wanted to make the fandom and the hobby overlap. Right. We wanted to make it into one uh, kind of package, if you will. Ideally, our original plan was actually to sell the adventure shirt and song as a package together. Unfortunately, we can't do that because of the way the DM is built to work. But you know, we're 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 working with the way we can. Um. Uh. And I have you know I have my my all kinds of stuff. I like that idea of like the the fandom. Uh, I love that fandom, man. It feels good. It, it feels nice that people like they just appreciate what I do or that my hobby. They have a knowledge of what my hobby is, as opposed to you know, which is great. Even just having that just goes so much farther and everything. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I've, been, I've, I've been able. I got to go to the uh, you know, speaking of critical role. I got to go to the live show they did in L.A. Uh, at mm-hmm. the beginning of this year, and All right on. and you know, D and D. My fandom has been very constrained to myself, my wife, and a couple of people in our group, mm-hmm. and so it was kind of my first time. Um, they had an art show opening too, so I went to this art show, and it was just it, it was an oh, yeah, amazing yeah. experience of 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 like you said, like people who had this common bond, this common ground, and they were expressing in different ways. They were cosplayers, they were musicians, they were painting minis, yeah. they were actors, like like whatever. But this you know this game allowed them way to express their particular passions and creativity, um, in something that spoke to everyone in the room. And and everyone could connect over that one thing. It just kind of it kind of blew my mind, and that's when I was like, okay, I think I need to I need to talk to people like this and, and hear what it is that makes them tick. Um, and and so it was a great moment for me. But but it's just it's an amazing thing to see and be a part of and get to experience because it's just a whole it crosses all boundaries. You know, it it doesn't yeah. matter your background, your race, your gender, what you're into. Like like it, it is a thing that truly unites people in, in a way that I haven't really yeah. seen before. Yeah, it's, 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 I like I like that. There's a lot of different entry points of the fandom. I think sure, I, you sure. you can come in through any way. There's not like one way to do it or not. Um, and I, I think that's actually one of the real keys nowadays of uh, generating any kind of like product is to have multiple entry points of fandom. Um, I, I don't think you can you can just say well here's the movie then you have to go get the other stuff after that. It has to be like well you can get the other stuff then you can get in the movie. I think that's I think that's one thing with like the Marvel movies is brilliant. You can go into the comic books, go into the movie, or you can go into the movie, then go into the comic books. You know, you can. There's all these different entry points you can start from, um, and it just makes it more accessible. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, we'll wrap up here in a minute, but but one question that I have for you: um, What about so so you DM and and now you write these yeah. adventures? 
Mm-hmm. What is different, if anything, in in the experience of prepping for a game session versus writing out uh, an adventure module? Um, you know, with some of the technical aspects of helping like guide other DMs through the game. Like, like what what are kind of kind of the differences that you run into there versus just prepping for your table? It's huge. Well, one, I actually, I don't do a lot of prep for my, my, my home games, actually. Um, a lot of it is very ad-libbed, um, and I kind of link uh, scenes together that I kind of want to have happen, but I'm also very aware of my players and where they're going to go and what their kind of ideas are, and I try to say yes to them a lot. Um, writing the adventure, I have to be more conscientious that I have a lot more, I have to kind of like constrain it a lot more. Uh, my, my home games are also a lot more... Um, adult in a sense i was like not like pornographic or anything like that but like more like they're the themes are very uh get a lot darker um i i i don't know my players have picked up on it but my, my major theme is like uh legacy and children it, it's been a theme throughout my campaign and kind okay. of like the, the there's kind of a price to to, to legacy and, and children um and it's 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 interesting to kind of like to play that out um I, I like my home games more than what I'm publishing. And the reason why is because uh, it, it is a intimate shared experience over an extended period of time. It is ours. It is only ours. No one else can buy it. No right. one else can have it. And they, we can share it with people to a degree, but they'll never have the full experience where Wolf Lord, Hey, look, I got a, I got a printed copy right here. Uh, it's a, uh, um, you know, we, I made it for a, a bigger audience and I also have to be constrained in the, in the DMs guild on how I handle things. So like I, uh, this is, we made it generic. Um, we often say that like it can be placed in forgotten realms anywhere. Uh, we made it so it could actually be put in Ravenloft quite, quite easily, okay. but I can't mention dragon Lance. I can't mention other things like that. Um, right. and it's okay. You know, that's, that's fine. That's, that's, that's the way it works. And I have to play by the rules. So I feel a little, I don't say I feel, I really don't feel that constrained. I didn't feel like constrained on Wolf Ward. But um, my home games, man, it's like I also let my players build the world. So my game originally began was like, here's a town. There's an event going on. Where is your character from? And they're like, where can I be from? I was like, well, where do you, what kind of place do you want to be from? And we, we built those in the game. So all these names and all these places have to be merged. And so we started with a center point and then expanded out. And some of them we haven't, they haven't even seen. Like one of them is from a place called Niltasu, which is like a, the best way to describe it is kind of a, a medieval Japanese society that's elves. And the Hiles are from there, and we we haven't gotten it yet, but they know about the political influence that place has, and they're dealing with the ramifications of the political influence and, and everything like that. So we kind of like um, I let them name things, I let them come up with things, I let them I let them create the story, and I, and because we share that, it isn't just me dictating to them what happens. Uh, or this like I'm dictating to someone that I'll never meet with with Wolf Lord, I I'll, I won't meet most people that ever play it. Right. And sure. So I, but I have to be aware. Of, I have to be aware of their of, of how to make sure they get what I'm trying to get say. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Let, let's do like, let's do a quick thought experiment. Like pretend, sure. uh, let's hope, right. The wolf Lord or whatever blows up. Right. What, what would it mean to you? If, if anything for you to someday meet someone who's like, Hey, I took the hook that you wrote. I took the adventure and, and we made it our own. And this is where it went. And, you know, here's this character and he ended up evolving into this. Like, like what would that mean for you as a, as a creator I- to hear that happen? Well, I had that happen with Children of the Hill, actually. I had we had a I had a new DM that ran it and her group took it someplace else and I was like, Awesome. I was like, it was great. Did you guys have fun? She's like, Yeah, did my did my product that you that you paid a buck for? Actually, no, she didn't actually I gave it to her for free. Actually, she was funny. She was talking about she's new DM and everyone's like, Hey, here's a new DM, can we help her out? And I was like, Yeah, here's my adventure and I sent her a copy of it for free. That's awesome. And and I was like, Let me know how it goes. That's the only thing I'm asking. Just let me know how it goes. And she's like, Yeah, we had a blast and it went somewhere different. And uh, I was like, cool, did it help you have fun? Yeah, it helped me, it helped me you know, think about how I'm going to run my game and what kind of things I can get my players. Okay, cool. Well, as long as you're deriving some value from it, that's, that's, that's all I really care about. You know, um, you know uh, and so that's kind of what I want is if, if it did it result in you having a good time. If you, if you don't play, because hers didn't go by the book, they did stuff I didn't expect. Or I probably wouldn't have had allowed to have happen in my, my own running of it. But they, they did. And they had fun. And that's all at the end of the day. That's all that matters for me. Um, so if, if I was to sell like, you know, 2,000 copies of Wolf Lord, fingers crossed, um, <laughs> and people were telling me all the kind of stuff they were digging with it, you know, I would, 
I would just use that largely as one, I'm glad I have a fun. Two, I would try to get feedback on what they liked and what they disliked and what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, you know, so yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm actually really happy with how Wolf Lord turned out. Uh, actually, that's, it's, a, it's a pretty, the one comment we get on it a lot is that it is extremely complete. Um, we, we actually modeled the layout off of Ravenloft. And I, and I actually think that Ravenloft, the, the Ravenloft campaign book, uh, the Curse of Strahd book, the strongest point of it is not the story. The strongest point of it is the layout. And we, we went for that. Um, and some of the, the official adventures that have come out have had a lot of issues with layout um, or just they don't. We, we, so we actually played Horde of the Dragon Queen when it came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a player in that, and we broke it within the first session. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, but we we ruined it. Yeah. Uh, and and it wasn't that it was like we were trying to. It was just like the options that they had anticipated for the group's take. I was like, why would I do that? Yeah. And and what it was is like you're supposed to like you know you're supposed to go with like this this group on a caravan up north, and I was like, well, if we're trying to trying to let these people up north know about them, and I have like the sailor background, why don't I catch a ship, take it north along the coast? quicker than they can go and let the people know they're coming. Sure. And yeah. so we completely, completely like off the rails, uh, you know, part of it, but we were, but here's the thing. We had fun. Do yeah. I feel the book was worth it? Yeah, we had fun and we, we got the game. We went out of it. So, and I know people are going to go off the rails of Wolf Lord. We, we built it so they don't really leave the Valley. Um, we, we built it so that it is a sandbox and it's populated but there's also plenty of area there where there's nothing listed. So you could make up whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we, have, we, have, we have a trilogy. So we're, we're working toward the trilogy. <laughs> Second part, third, part, third part's going to be the, uh, we're, it, our, our game is kind of like, you know, we're not doing the whole like star Wars thing where you have like new hope empire strikes back to dark movie. And then you have a trilogy, which is a lot of fun. Ours is more like, uh, new hope empire strikes back than empire strikes back times two like <laughs> right. we go from like worse double, to worse. double down I'm, I'm on the dark to, well yeah i don't yeah my players i i don't tear, i don't try to tear them apart but like i i also don't let them like i there's consequences to every action we actually did that wolf with the consequence mechanic in there it's actually there's little blue boxes that says like you know keep track of what happens to this person because the next adventure that's going to come up oh that's awesome yeah that's a great mechanic and, right exactly and the idea is that like if you, you don't have to play the previous one, that's fine. But if you did, bonus, there's more storyline. And I, I, I took actually a lot of that from the Dragon Age uh, games, which I really like. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, the pen and paper version of that game is amazing. The actual role-playing game is freaking amazing. That's, that's actually the first game I played as a teen ever was the Dragon She was like, she loved it. Like, it's a super simple, quick, dirty role-playing game. Yeah. Character journey takes three, four minutes. And it's fun. It just, it's just, it doesn't, it's not system heavy. Um, that's the same system that the expanse role playing games using, which are actually, that's actually the game we want to play next. That's on our list. I'm a big fan of the expanse. That's kind of like one of those, like, man, when I have time, we're going to play that for sure. Good. Yeah. That one's stellar. No, no pun intended, but it looks stellar. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So what else? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, man. Awesome. Well, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up here, but, uh, let people know where can they, where can they find you online? Uh, where can they check out cauldron and tower and your work? And, uh, yeah. Where can they find you? Sure. So uh, personally, uh, you can find me on pretty much everything, uh, Instagram and Twitter, uh, at OnlyPlayWizards, one word. Uh, you can find call and also OnlyPlayWizards.com is where my blog is, which I need to update more. Uh, you can find uh, me, John Boltina, also with Cauldron and Tower, which is on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. It's uh, Cauldron and then the letter N, then Tower. Um, we had a, we had a truncated a little bit for, for I think for, uh, for Instagram or Twitter, which one, um, you can also find us, uh, cauldron and tower dot com, where we have all our shirts for sale and wares and hats and hopefully more coming soon. We're hoping to have uh, tank tops coming out this month, actually, uh, or in October too, for our next release, the complete revenant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look us up and, uh, we, we love hearing from fans. We love seeing people wear our gear. We love hearing people play our adventures. We love photos. We love interaction. Um, we love music. We have a Spotify list that we put up. We update every Monday and, and try to get people, hey, you know, listen to this and get yourself for the week or use this to get some in- inspiration for your video, for your uh, role-playing games for the weekend or whatever it is, you know, get, get amped up, right? So Totally. And, yeah. and on uh, and on DM's Guild, if they want to go get Wolf, Wolf Lord of Yol, 
It's, it's Yol, yeah, right? Yeah. Y-O-L? Yol? Yeah, it's actually, Yol is actually an, an old spelling of the word Yule. Actually, okay. yeah, okay. we actually, we actually arrived at that. Uh, there's, there's a lot with that. A little Christmas theme going on? Uh, a, little, a little Druidic. Druidic, Yeah, we have a perfect. lot of hidden references in there, yeah. Um, the uh, You can actually uh, find, you can go look me up anywhere on, on the uh, DMs Guild for John Boltina. But also, you can look up Cauldron. Uh, if you look up the word Cauldron, actually, on DMs Guild, you'll find our stuff as well. But we have links on our Instagram, on our Twitter, uh, on our Facebook. Um, we have a Discord channel now, too, which has been a lot of fun. I talk, I've been talking about miniatures on there with uh, uh, some of the other guys. Actually, one, another one of the guys that won one of the shirts, he's been talking about miniatures and everything. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Well, hey, right. thanks again. I, I appreciate the time. And uh, hopefully, we get to catch up with you again soon. Love to talk with your partner sometime, too, and, and kind of hear her side of the, of the creation process. Yeah, we're we're on a. Uh, I'm actually rounding out the first part of uh, the next the next uh, part of the Yule Valley saga, and then um, I'm going to have her come in and um, depopulate the towns and everything too. That, that's actually her biggest strength. That she's really good at doing NPCs, man. Like she's like a fantastic at writing great NPCs, and I really like that relationship that we have. That we have, we have both have our strengths, and we both you know kind of we can let each other in when we need to, and everything. It's fantastic. So yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, hey, thanks again. Um, like we said, guys, check out Wolf Lord of Yule on DMs Guild, and uh, check out John online, Cauldron and Tower on the various social medias or Only Play Wizards. And uh, for us, you can find us at Roll Number Four Persuasion at a uh, Twitter and Instagram. Again, they kind of limit your characters, so Roll Number Four Persuasion or Roll for Persuasion dot com. And uh, thanks. Listen in next time uh, for our next interview. And John, it was great having you on. Take care, man. Thank you.